After Jesus rose from the dead, he had a walk with a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he later uh, met with his disciples. And on both occasions, he said this, that everything that was written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The Psalms are quoted more than any other book of the Old Testament by the New Testament authors. So the connection between the Psalms and the Messiah, Jesus, uh, are many. I wanna look at five of these Messianic Psalms. Uh, there are more than this, but these are the ones that the New Testament authors seem to have really focused on as being significant in revealing the character and the nature of the Messiah. Now, first, a word about Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word that means anointed one. The Greek equivalent is Christ or Christos, and uh, this refers to the king. David, uh, one of the, the second king of Israel, was anointed. We have that recorded for us. And this was a ceremony whereby oil was poured upon them as setting them apart uh, for this service to God as king. And so a messianic psalm uh, overlaps with the royal psalms. There are maybe 10 royal psalms, it depends on how you're counting them. But these royal psalms uh, speak to the role of the Messiah, the king in the nation of Israel. Uh, the king was to be a representative of God. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the people were to look to the king and they would see his glory, his majesty, his power, his victory in battle, his uh, uh, his his. Uh, eloquence, all of these would speak to the glory of God as well as, as his representative. The king would also act as God's agent. Uh, he would execute uh, justice. He was the Supreme Court of the land. He would also execute justice on the nations, on the battlefield. Uh, so the king and God had this close relationship. In fact, so much so that Psalm 2 uh, refers to the king as the son of God, as the representative of God. Uh, so Israel's monarchy lasted for roughly 400 or so years from the time of King Saul to the Babylonian uh, conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Following that, the Jewish people were ruled by the Babylonians, by the Persians, by the Greeks. Uh, then they enjoyed a brief period of independence and then the Romans uh, came in and subdued them. So for those 500, 600 years of history, uh, there really wasn't a monarchy. And so by the first century, the Jewish people were, were looking, anticipating a king uh, to come and, uh, and be all that the king was supposed to be, this representative and agent of God among them. This anticipation was so high in the time of Jesus that when he came on the scene, uh, they thought he might be the Messiah. In fact, he was doing such amazing things that by, uh, by the time he fed the 5,000, according to Matthew's gospel, it, it says that they tried to make him king by force. But Jesus wasn't exactly the kind of king uh, that they, they were looking for. There was another aspect, and these Psalms in particular highlight those aspects of Jesus's kingship. So I'm gonna take a look at these five Psalms and we'll see from them what they tell us about Jesus as a Messiah. The first, uh, we've already covered. Session two, we talked in depth about the second Psalm. And the key I want to emphasize here is that Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of God. This is a term that is used in the psalm. The Lord said uh, to, to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I'll make the nations your, your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with the rod of iron. You'll dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Uh, Jesus was declared to be God's son at his baptism, the voice from heaven, as you will call. Later, at his transfiguration, a voice from heaven also said, this is my son. And at his crucifixion, a Roman centurion stood there and looked at Jesus and said, surely this is the Son of God. Jesus is declared to be the Son of God. And if, if this is a fulfillment of the second Psalm, as the early church saw it, according to Acts chapter four, they quote this Psalm in reference to Jesus. And this means the rest of the Psalm is true about Jesus as well, that he will possess the nations and that the, the ends of the earth will be his. And indeed, that's exactly what has happened in history as the church, as the kingdom of God, led by Jesus, the King, the Son of God, has gone forth and won the nations uh, to Christ and to allegiance to him, uh, to the ultimate King. Our second Psalm we'll look at is Psalm 45. Uh, psalm 45 is a wedding song. Uh, a royal song about a royal wedding. And uh, like most wedding songs, it has some great things to say about the groom and the bride. It begins with the groom 
uh, describes this, this king, this groom, as handsome, as eloquent, as strong and mighty in battle. And in particular, it notes that he is uh, committed to the cause of justice and gentleness and truth. Again, characteristics that were not necessarily true of the other kings and gods of the ancient world. Yet the writer of Hebrews quotes this psalm in reference to Jesus in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus is the groom, the king, in this psalm. The psalm goes on to describe the beauty of the ivory palaces, the fragrance of the robes, the, the, the stringed music, all the things you might expect at a royal wedding. And then it describes the bride, the queen, the one who is by his side with a gown interwoven with gold. In verse 10, the psalm says, listen, daughter, pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. That's good advice. You are getting a new identity. So forget your father's people in, and uh, in your father's house, you have a new name. Verse 11, let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. Now, if the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the king, he is the groom, then who is the bride but the church? The church is identified as the bride of Christ. And so Jesus is identified in Psalm 45 as, as a husband. Now, there are many metaphors for the church in the New Testament. The church is the family of God, the household of God. The church is a temple, and we are all stones built in that temple. Uh, the church is a body. Christ is the head, and we are the body of Christ. In Ephesians 5, Paul says that the church is the bride of Christ. And what I love about this psalm is it tells us that our groom, Jesus, is enthralled with the beauty of the church. Now, the church isn't always so beautiful. Uh, it's not perfect, not the perfect bride, but in the eyes of Jesus, she is beautiful. You know, when we go to a wedding, there's uh, always this moment where the bride enters. Everyone stands, every eye is upon her, but uh, I like to do something different at that moment. I like to also take a look at the groom. I like to catch his expression when he sees her for the first time walking down that aisle. And I think of this psalm, and I think of that phrase, enthralled with her beauty. That is, that's how Jesus feels about you and me and the church. In spite of our ugliness and imperfections and failures, he is in love with the church. And Paul says that he gave himself up for her to, uh, to, to make her a holy bride. Yes, Jesus as Messiah is the husband of the church. Uh, psalm 110 is quoted by six different people in the New Testament. It makes it pretty significant. It seems to be perhaps the key messianic psalm. And this psalm reveals that the Messiah is king first. And he is a king who will absolutely dominate. The, the text says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The psalmist goes on to describe just the absolute victory that this king will enjoy and that uh, he will have willing soldiers who will come and they're willing to follow him into battle, uh, even into death. Uh, the Messiah is the great king, but he is also a great high priest. Now, if it's clear that Jesus is the king of Psalm 110, then it's also clear that he is the priest because in verse 4, of the same psalm, it says, the Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. You are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, that's interesting. It's the only place that this name Melchizedek occurs in the, in the Old Testament outside of its original in Genesis 14. Now, the kings of Judah exercised some priestly functions. David uh, led the people in worship. He wrote Psalms. Uh, Solomon built a temple and dedicated it. So they had a priestly function. Uh, but this is, uh, this is something different. Uh, Melchizedek uh, is a character that appears and disappears. In Genesis 14, he shows up. He is identified as the king of Salem. And uh, Salem may have been Jerusalem, an ancient Jerusalem. Salem means peace. And so he is the king of peace. His name Melchizedek, Melchizedek is king of righteousness, king of righteousness, king of peace. 
uh, we don't know anything about his ancestry. We uh, don't have a genealogy and we don't have any record of his death. And so it could be said that he is without beginning and without end. He just shows up and then disappears. Also, we know that he blesses Abraham, and the writer of Hebrews says that means that he is greater than Abraham. Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek, again, indicating Melchizedek's greatness. And the writer of Hebrews makes much of this Melchizedek priesthood in chapters 5 and chapter 7 of Hebrew, Hebrews and using this text to link those two together. Now, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, so that made him in ineligible to be a typical priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi. But the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is priest on the basis of an indestructible life. He is a forever priest because of his resurrection from the dead. So this psalm points to the resurrection of Jesus as well as his priestly role as one who intercedes on our behalf. And that leads us to Psalm 22, which we covered in session five. And psalm 22 is the psalm that Jesus prayed from the cross. It uh, exemplifies the suffering that he experienced, his uh, apparent abandonment uh, by God, by humanity, the mocking that he endured, the, the painful stretching of his body, bones out of joint, his tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth, uh, piercing of his hands and feet. All of these are described in this psalm. It was clearly a messianic psalm. The writer of Hebrews, again, helps us connect this psalm to Jesus in a different way, though. The writer of Hebrews quotes verse 22 of this psalm. This is the part of the psalm where uh, the psalmist turns to trust and confidence and praise following his suffering. And verse 22 says, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. The writer of Hebrews identifies Jesus here as brother. He says, uh, he is not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to call us brothers, ex showing us that Jesus was willing to suffer with us, become one of us. And that's what the writer of Hebrews uh, makes much of. He says that he was made like us in every way so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus suffers with us. Now, that idea was a stumbling block in the first century to the, to the Jewish people who are expecting uh, a Solomon-like, a, a David-like king. Indeed, Jesus had said of himself, one greater than Solomon is here. Jesus said it. I'm greater than David. I'm greater than Solomon. And here's why. Because I'm one of you. I'll suffer with you. I'm your, I'm your brother. And that brings us to Psalm 118, one of the greatest messianic psalms. Psalm 118 is a psalm of Passover. There are six psalms of Passover, Psalms 113 through 118, were traditionally sung and prayed during that week of the Passover celebration in the spring when they recalled the exodus of Egypt and they relived uh, those experiences in the Passover meal. Jesus, of course, had this Passover meal with his disciples and no doubt prayed these six psalms of which 118 is the last one. It's a, a psalm that is a song of thanksgiving for deliverance uh, by, uh, and it's sung by a king, by a Davidic king. Um, it, uh, in fact, quotes uh, Exodus 15, the song of the sea. It's the central verse of the psalm. It says, the Lord, my strength, my song has become my salvation. This psalm is referenced four times in the Gospels. Two of them very clearly, two of them, uh, I'll, I'll point you there. But the first one is that this psalm was quoted by the people as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On that Sunday afternoon, as he is riding into the city on a donkey, they're waving palm branches and they're shouting, Hosanna, Lord save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're singing Psalm 118 to Jesus, the Messiah, as he enters into Jerusalem. A few days later, Jesus is in the temple and there's what we call the day of questions. And this is the second use of this Psalm. Jesus tells a parable of the tenants uh, to the Pharisees, the Herodians who wanted to kill him. He said, uh, there, there's the story of the, of the tenants, this master who owns a vineyard and he leaves it uh, to the tenants to take care of while he goes away. Uh, the master sends servants periodically to collect the harvest and instead of collecting the harvest, the tenants uh, beat them and kill them. And finally, the master says, I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect him. But instead, the tenants said, no, uh, we're going to kill the son and this will all be ours. And Jesus, of course, was talking about what the Pharisees were planning to do to him. And 
in that context, Jesus quotes this psalm and these words. He says, have you never read in the scriptures? There's a little bit of sarcasm there. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Jesus identifies himself here as the cornerstone. And the cornerstone also is a fascinating word. The literal Greek translation of this word is the head of the corner. And in construction, this word had four uses. There was the cornerstone, probably the most obvious one here, is the foundation stone, the first stone that's laid, the stone that bears the weight of the building, and the stone that orients everything around its position, the cornerstone. It's also translated capstone. So this refers to a second use of this word, and that would be for the final stone, the final piece that was laid. When the building was complete, you had a big ceremony, a big celebration, you placed that final stone to say, it is finished, it is done, it's completed. There's nothing more to be added to this building. Jesus is both cornerstone, the first, and the capstone, the last, the one that completes. And there's another use of this word, and it is as the keystone of an arch. So in an arch, you have two sides that are being built towards each other. That keystone sits in the middle and it bears the weight of the sides and everything that's on top. It's one of the strongest architectural forms. Jesus is that keystone, that centerpiece, that is the weight-bearing, load-bearing one on whom everything comes together and is sustained. <laughs> wow, Jesus is the cornerstone, the capstone, the keystone of our faith. There's another reference. It's not quite as clear, but it's this fact that Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is the lamb. This is found for us in verse 24. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is God. He's made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. The festal sacrifice, the Passover lamb. This was an integral part of the Passover service, to, to select uh, a lamb and then four days later to slaughter it and offer it as a sacrifice, reminding them of the Passover lamb that was slain centuries ago, delivering them from Egypt. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. In fact, when he uh, is pointed out by John the Baptist, this is what John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And also, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has sacrificed. Of course, Jesus wasn't bound with ropes, as the psalmist said. He was bound uh, with nails. But Jesus was the Passover lamb, and this psalm points to that. And so when we say, this is the day the Lord has made, we're not talking about today, this date. We're talking about this date, that Good Friday, when Jesus, the Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. That is the day the Lord has made that we rejoice and are glad in. There's a fourth reference, I believe, in this psalm in the New Testament. Again, it's not as obvious, but uh, follow me here. Uh, Jesus clearly uh, sang this psalm at the Passover supper. This was part of the tradition. The Gospels tell us that as the disciples and Jesus left that upper room and they went to the garden to pray, it says that they sang a hymn. Now, this is the last of the six hymns of the Passover songs, and so I think it's a fairly good uh, possibility that this is the psalm that Jesus and his disciples sang on their way to the garden. And in the garden, Jesus is going to wrestle with this Passover lamb. He is understanding that he is the Passover lamb. And, that he will be slaughtered uh, for the sake of the people. And he wrestles with it. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done, ultimately, is what he comes down on. And to think about Jesus praying this psalm on the way to the garden, consider these words in that light. Verse 18, verse 17. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. What if in the garden, Jesus was thinking of these words, of this 
declaration, I shall not die, but live. I will walk through the gates. I will enter into death and I will come out the other side and I will break open that tomb and come forth from those gates. What if this was the Psalm that was in Jesus' mind as he was praying in the garden? He had just sung these words and that he knew that even though he was laying down his life, that it would not be the end. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He is the husband to his bride, the church. He is the king who is absolutely victorious in every way, and he is the great high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. He is our brother. He knows what it is to be one of us. He suffers with us. He feels with us, and he is the cornerstone, the first, the last, the one who holds all things together, and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and who was resurrected on that third day to give us victory.